am Daniel Ortiz, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years, and today I have my special guest. He's the author of The Tragedy of Sudan, no other than Mr. John Palladino. Welcome back, Mr. John, and where have you been? Honestly, I've been really busy, so I haven't really done all that much. Uh, I was helping my my brother move back home, and that took most of my time. That's why I haven't been online much, and I haven't really been writing much either. It's been a slow couple of months for me. And let's talk about these two series is it a series right you're making this series or trilogy if i'm not mistaken yeah it's a series of four books actually and then there will be some standalone like other i guess in the same series but not required i guess that'd be awesome so let's do the recap or the first book the trials of ashman how did you craft it uh, well, I wrote it during uh, the COVID pandemic when I quit my job, and I always had the, I've always had the magic system kind of in my head since I was in high school. So I finally decided, you know what, I'm gonna take the opportunity and uh, write because I quit my job and uh, no one was hiring at the time because it was COVID. So I uh, just started writing. I'm just curious, Mr. John, what is your day job before? My, oh, before, yes. Yeah, so I used to be an assistant manager at Burger King. Uh, it's not a luxurious job, but it uh, paid the bills. I, it was a decent amount of money. Uh, and when COVID happened, uh, we didn't know how long it was going to last. Uh, seemed like, I think it lasted about, uh, the work ramifications anyway lasted about six months I think and I quit uh, two months into it I think uh, and the, the reason I quit was because my my bosses were kind of screwing me over I was already kind of sick of the job but I uh, kept having things taken away from me so I had my overtime taken away uh, which is really the only way I was making money there otherwise it was not worth it and then i had like vacation time that i had scheduled taken away i i believe i was supposed to get a a raise or a promotion i don't remember exactly because there was a lot of things happening all at the same time and i can't remember what was exactly a result of covid and what just like happened outside of it but all of these things happened and that's why i ended up quitting and i i just decided is it worth it that you quit your job and your focus in your writing I think it depends on what you determine as worth. If you're talking financially, definitely not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But uh, it gave me the chance to really pursue what I've always wanted to do, which was write. And uh, I've seen, I I don't want to say a lot of success because I haven't, but I've done well enough where it's uh, given me the proof that like, I should just keep trying this and see if i can like grow it into a stable income i guess uh right now it's certainly not a livable wage but uh i that's fine i'm uh just gonna try and keep going for another year or two get a couple more books out there see if see if we can get it there yes cross my finger mr john so what are your short-term and long-term goals in writing Uh, Well, my short-term goals would be to finish the series I'm writing right now, uh, The Tragedy of Sedane, and get a couple – I have a short story anthology I'm going to get out there soon. Uh, And and once the series is complete, I will kind of take in and out – like I will analyze where where I'm at and how much I've grown and – 
if it continues to see the same amount of growth that I'm seeing right now, then I'll continue. Uh, if, if I kind of stagnate and don't go anywhere, then uh, I think I'll have to unfortunately uh, do something else and, you know, get a, a, a real job. <laughs> and, uh, not that writing isn't a real job, but I, I guess I mean like uh, a, a real income. And if I do that, I don't know if I'll be able to write because I have a really hard time uh, writing when I have a full-time job. I've, I've tried it before. I'll do really well for a couple of days and then maybe I'll have like one, one day of like really tiring work maybe. And then I'll come home and I just like won't write. And uh, then I kind of just won't write again, <laughs> which uh, not good if you're trying to finish a book. Let's talk about the first book, Tragedy of Sudan. Why you choose Tragedy of Sudan as the title of your quartet? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let me see if I can... I, I guess there's really two answers to that. There's like the non-spoiler answer, which is the one I'll give you. <laughs> <laughs> then there's kind of a spoiler answer, which um, I guess even if you've read the first two books, you would not, uh, you wouldn't still understand it. Uh, but the non-spoiler answer would be that uh, I wanted to write a, a grimdark fantasy. And uh, when I finished The Trials of Ashbound, I realized I need to come up with a series title. And I don't remember what the one was before I came up with Tragedy of Sedain. Uh, but I had a different title. And I, I wish I could remember what it was. But it, it just didn't work. I didn't like it didn't feel good and so then I thought about it for a minute and I was like well Sedane is the world uh that the books take place in and there's a lot of things that happen in the world that are uh really bad and so I was like well the tragedy of Sedane fits that really well so I'll do that how did I come up with that I I don't really know um there is, again, a spoiler answer, but even that answer, I don't know if <laughs> that directly like, came up with the name. But yeah, it's a little hard to answer without getting into spoilers, but that would be spoilers for books that aren't even out yet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, I feel like that would be a bad idea. For me, it's really unique. There's a question mark on it and something that people curious about it. That's why they're going to buy your books. So the Trials of Ashman, what is the best highlight? I've heard a couple things. Uh, some people really like the hard magic systems that I have. And I have, I have two different magic systems uh, that have very defined rules. Um, but for, for me, I guess uh, it was more so like the the characters I, I think i really liked the idea of having five well actually originally it was only going to be four but it ended up being five points of view and they start in like really really separate stories and really far apart from each other in the in the world and then they uh kind of slowly get brought together and that apparently a lot of people don't like that uh i've gotten some uh bad like, like negative reviews uh where people are like yeah this nothing comes together and i'm halfway through so i'm not going to finish the book and that's fine if you're somebody that needs everything to come together in the first book you're not going to like the trials of ash Mount. that's true uh but for people who are uh i was going to say more patient but that might be the wrong word someone that just prefers maybe a longer uh, buildup in terms of people coming together. Uh, I think that the second book, Buzzard's Bowl, will really kind of start to display that. Uh, but you have to make it through the first book because the first book is really uh, pretty separate from most of the time. <clears throat> so, Mr. John, can you define what is a grimdark? 
Sure. Uh, I have my own definition of what Grimdark is, and some hardcore Grimdark fans will probably disagree, and that's uh, perfectly fine. But my personal definition of what Grimdark fantasy is, uh, uh, morally gray characters are realistic consequences are the two things that I genuinely or generally uh, think of as being Grimdark. So morally gray characters, meaning that um, the good people can do bad things, maybe for good reasons, or maybe for bad or selfish reasons. Um, and bad people have believable reasons for why they're doing bad things. They, they could also do good things. You know, people do things that maybe are more self-serving or more realistic, right? Because generally yes. throughout history, there's not many people who are just good for the sake of being good or, or bad for the sake of being bad. You know, even some of the, the biggest evil people in history generally had uh, some, not all of them, but a lot of them had like, you can kind of see why or how they became the way they, they did, right? They had reasons that they at least believed were uh, justifiable. Were they right? And that's, you know, whole debate, I guess, for each person that you would talk about. But uh, in, in books, it's just believable when there's reasons that like they're doing something that you can like understand, at least you might not have to agree with it, but as long as you understand them. Uh, and then realistic consequences, meaning like bad things will happen to whoever, you know, you know, people will die in war. Uh, if, if a main character is uh, in a in a duel, maybe you know they could die, right? So, if you're captured, maybe something bad is going to happen to you, probably uh, things like that. And I just think that generally, a lot of grimdark people fans will say things like, "Grimdark has to be hopeless. Grimdark has to have like a really dark." Not not everyone does. Very well said, Mr. Jan. So who influenced you in writing Grimdark? Did you say who influenced me in writing Grimdark? Yes. Uh, I would say there's two main influences. Uh, the first would be Joe Abercrombie. And Joe Abercrombie is my favorite author. He is a funny story because I almost quit reading fantasy altogether. And then my friend recommended me uh, Joe Abercrombie. And this would have been back in 2007, I think it was. It might have been 2008 in that year, though. And I was living in a dorm with him in college. And I told him I was done with fantasy because I it had gotten way too predictable, way too cliche. And... I was over it and he gave me the blade itself and said you need to read this book you will love it and i read the first chapter and uh i guess minor spoilers for anyone who hasn't read it itself in the first chapter uh the character that's that what you're following in the first chapter gets uh thrown off a cliff or falls off a cliff and goes into a river and like doesn't die and when I read that, I was like, this is ridiculous. I am not reading this stupid book. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, I actually threw it at my friend. I said, why would you even recommend it? And um, he was like, well, hold on. Try, try chapter two. And so I tried chapter two. And I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure chapter two is the first Glockta chapter, who is a... Uh, crippled like torturer <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so he's uh torturing somebody and it was super dark and from then on i was completely hooked so i've read every single joe abercrombie book as soon as it comes out i i love him he's my favorite author so that's my first influence my second influence would be uh george rr R. martin i got into the game of thrones pretty late i think when i read his first four books, it was right before the fifth book was about to come out. So I actually got to read the fifth book as soon as I finished like the four books, which was great. And I, I love the, 
I love those books a lot. They're amazing. Uh, and I would consider both Abercrombie and Martin to be two really prominent uh, grimdark authors. And a lot of people would actually say that they are not grimdark. So, <laughs> you know, it kind of just depends on your definition of grimdark, I guess. But they're my two uh, biggest influences. I'd say Abercrombie for uh, characters and like writing style. Uh, George R. R. Martin, also kind of the characters, but more like the world and uh, the scope of things. So if you describe their writing, how how do you describe these styles, style of writing? Abercrombie and Martin, you mean? Yes. So Abercrombie is a very witty and humorous, uh, clever author. Uh, it's really good at character work too. Uh, but his general narrative, his style is just really funny and uh, easy to read and consume and very fast paced. And I really like that about Abercrombie. Uh, it's my favorite type of writing. And I, I tried to write somewhat like that myself. Uh, I'm no master like Abercrombie at that, but I, I tried to kind of implement the things I liked about his writing and my writing. And then Martin is a lot slower, uh, a lot more normally like epic fantasy paced, I guess. But man, when he does, when he does things in the book, it's just like completely grips you. Uh, I, Martin just has a way with like writing that I absolutely love, but it's, it's interesting because I'm not generally uh, like a slower paced fan as much I, I generally prefer the faster paced books but uh martin is an exception and then there's patrick rothfuss and robin hobb who i both i love both of them and they're both slower paced as well and uh i don't know what it is about those three authors specifically that has grips me so well um i don't i don't know exactly but i love them and i don't necessarily know why <laughs> 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 definitely so which one do you like for george martin the series or the book itself oh you mean between the books or the the tv series yes well that's easy uh i read the books before the show and loved the books and then the show came out and i watched the entire show but most of the series that I saw I'd already read. So it was like, it was really good, but I'd already, I already knew everything that was going to happen. So it wasn't like that great. And then once you got into stuff that like we hadn't read, um, there was like, I think there was one season that was really good. And then there was like two or three seasons that were not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I definitely prefer the books. So do you like the ending of the show? No, that was the worst thing I've ever, like, I <laughs> I could go on a rant for a really long time about how bad that was. I, I don't understand what they were doing there. It was awful. So if you will be the writer of Game of Thrones, the finale. So obviously this will probably be spoilers for the five people who haven't seen the ending of Game of Thrones. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if we're talking about specifically just the last season, um, I think that probably makes the most sense. Uh, I think the first major flaw, and it's been a really long time since I've seen the show. I watched it live and I haven't seen it since. So if I get something wrong here, anyone listening, I apologize. I'm just going based off my memory. So I think the first major problem I had with the show was the episode i think it was called the long night um it was first of all when it came out on tv it was way too dark uh i think when they maybe put it on their streaming services they lightened it back up but it was filmed purposely to be like too dark yeah. to see well, yes it was very annoying and so that was the one problem is that it was very hard to see anything and the second problem is that you have this 
whole war happening between uh it's i think this happens at winterfell and it's the like dead people i forgot what they're called uh from the other side of the wall where the night king is and you have this huge war you've built up to this war the entire show or the entire series uh all the books too, right? They're always talking about winter is coming and things are going to go down. And when they finally attack, it's the most ridiculous war ever because again, I might have this wrong, but I don't think a single named like character dies outside of the Night King, I guess, if you consider him named. But it was so insanely ridiculous how in danger so many of the characters uh were and then how they all escaped it somehow and that's very like not game of thrones this if that was me that was doing that battle i would have killed off uh a lot of people in that fight because it was such a war it was a war that had been built up for so long that i really feel like it should have made an impact <laughs> uh, also it was the first like major battle on on land i i don't remember i i think there was a battle at the wall uh when they broke through but that was just the wall it was i, I believe it was the only major battle like outside of the wall when they broke in and they lost <laughs> it <laughs> yes. just felt weird uh, so i would have extended that to a lot a lot more i think um would have killed some characters to actually make them seem like a scary force. And then uh, after that, you have like the ending ending where everything goes to shit. Um, let's see here. <laughs> the way the Lannisters die was really bad. And Cersei, it was just stupid. Jamie Lannister had like this whole arc where he like, became a good person almost and and then kind of went right back to his roots and it didn't make any sense uh daenerys targaryen went like crazy which um there were hints of that throughout the show but it was such an abrupt like ending i feel like it went to a point where it's almost unbelievable how like bloodthirsty of a tyrant she was there yes. and uh her ending was really stupid too. And they really butchered some characters like like Varys and Tyrion Lannister. They just like, those two characters specifically were really clever and smart and uh, always doing really good stuff. And then, and then the showrunners ran out of like book material. And I, I feel like they just didn't know how to write them because those characters immediately became like, not dumb, but like, I don't know. I guess dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said, Mr. John. So before we uh, go on, I want to shout out to the people listening in India. In Maharashtra, I got, got 20%. Kamataka at 15%. Telagna at 11%. Andhra Pradesh at 15%. National Capital Territory of Delhi, 10%. Tamil Nadu at 8%. West Bengal at 5%. Uda Pradesh at 3%, Rajasthan at 3%, Haryana at 3%, Gujarat at 3%, Kerala, uh, Mahadeya Pradesh, Odisha, Punjab. I have a lot of places in India. Sorry if I cannot read them all, but from the bottom of my heart, Namaste India for supporting this podcast. And thank you so much because this podcast is created in power writers all over the world like Mr. John Paladino. So, Mr. John, Trials of Asmon, what else you can say about it? Uh, well, it's a grimdark fantasy. It's uh, fast-paced. I like to think it's somewhat funny. Uh, I like the unpredictable nature of the book, and it's been, like, doing really well. Uh, it's been I don't know what happens, but when book two came out, book one just seemed to blow up. Uh, last I checked, I'm sure it's not there anymore because it's been kind of a slower day. But yeah, I'm still in the top 100 uh, in the fantasy category, which is 
crazy. I'm number yes. 100 right now. <laughs> I hope or, actually no, I just refreshed. I'm 81. Let's support Mr. John, people, so that more folks to come. Grim dark. And according to Mr. Bear, Mr. Bear, unexpected new favorite. Oh, wow. What are the elements that you put in the trials of asthma that make your readers glued to it? Um, That's a good question. I've heard the magic system and the world building are two uh, favorites from uh, from readers. Uh, the first like line of the book is he pissed himself, and that seems to really just pull people in, I guess. <laughs> and according to Mr. Michael Roberti, oh, Michael Roberti is one of my guests before. Bloody bold and resolute. Wow. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean that would be that would be awesome if you know people would pick up a copy on Amazon. That's only ninety nine cents if you get the uh, ebook. Yes, people, let's support Mr. John. And the last time we talked about the Bossard's Bowl, one of the comments of your readers is, "What the f? What happened to the f, Mr. John?" <laughs> <laughs> is it outstanding f right congratulations i hope it the, the book will become one of top 10 bestsellers <laughs> thank you that would be fantastic yes and according to uh because last time we discussed this one there's no reviews yet and there's a lot of reviews now so according to miss athena or oh, athena yes dark gray Awesome. Oh, how dark it is, Mr. John. What's, yeah, the, difference, I mean, what's the difference of dark and gray? Oh. <laughs> oh, man, that's like a tricky question. I'm not necessarily the best person to ask, probably, because I don't necessarily know. But uh, I think dark would be like uh, brutal unexpected i think gray so like I, I think the difference between dark and gray would be like a main character could die in a dark book i think in a gray book i don't know if a main character would die i feel like maybe they do some things that uh are not great but uh i i guess so it I guess another example would be like in a gray book, you might have someone that uh, thinks some bad things or maybe does a few bad things, but not anything terribly awful uh, from the point of view of a main character. But in a dark book, the point of view character could like easily do um, some really horrific things, I think. Definitely. And according to Mr. Bear, 320, I think it's your avid fan because Mr. Bear on the uh, the Trials Asman is number one reviewer there. Very dark, very engrossing. So how how dark it is if you compare for the Trials of Asman? Uh, so I would say that the Trials of Ashmount, with the exception of one or two scenes, isn't like super dark. But Buzzard's Bowl is definitely a lot darker i think um there's a lot more things that happen that might bother people i don't know so for the third series do you think if the buzzer's ball is more darker the third series is uh more more darker <laughs> twice oh, yeah. the darker it is um i actually specifically started writing the book the third book from a much more uh darker standpoint and uh we'll see how that goes because there is a few scenes in there that were pretty pretty dark <laughs> <laughs> i love that interesting darkness oh my goodness so this will be a quartet after the quartet are you uh, planning to do have a prequel of this series uh no i i'm not well 
Okay, that's kind of a complicated question. So as the series ends, I have ideas for one standalone that comes directly after the series ends. And then I have an idea for another standalone book that actually starts way before the series uh, starts and then ends at the beginning of a sequel series that I do plan on writing. Interesting, Mr. Jan. So, Bowser's Bow, what are the elements that you put in the story that make this more darker than the trials of Ashmont? Well, Buzzard's Bowl has, hmm, I think that it it's just a darker story overall. There's some there's some torture. Uh, there's, oh, I think personally, people might disagree. I guess it's all subjective, but personally, I think some of the deaths in Buzzard's Bowl are a lot more like brutal and uh upsetting than like the trials of ashmount uh the trials of ashmount did have some brutality and some surprising deaths but i think that people didn't really get emotional about anything that happened in the trials of ashmount um i think buzzard's bowl it does make some people feel pretty sad about some things that happen I don't want to get into spoilers, but yes, definitely. So we go and I'm inviting you to please do grab a copy of my latest book, Earth, Unrevealing Climate and Our Race to Restore Balance. It's all about my climate change book, people. So please do grab a copy available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. So Mr. John, can you please invite our listeners to buy all your books? The Trials of Ashmont and Buzzard's Bowl are both on Amazon. You can get the ebook, paperback, or hardcover on Amazon. Also, if you would like uh, signed copies of either book, uh, you can find them both at Broken Binding. And uh, then there's also an indie bookstore called Silverstones, and they stock um, both both copies of my book, uh, paperback and hardcover, I believe. Uh, and so there's there's uh, some good options there. Broken Binding is, I think, the only place right now that you can get signed copies, though. Yes, people, let's support Mr. John Palladino because the books that he's making is dark, dark, dark. It's something else, people, so... If you want Mr. John to write more books, let's support him. Mr. John, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you for having me, Daniel. I appreciate it. Morgan people, see you soon.